Wow. What did they say, like, don't follow or work with kids or animals? <laughs> Wish they had told me that was going to be the video before we got things warmed up. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Sekou Biddle. I'm a 1993 New York City core member alumni. Happy to welcome you here and also proud district residents, so welcome to my hometown. Hope you all have a good time and learn a lot. They're inspired to do what you're doing better, faster, higher, harder, and stronger as we go forward. Really looking forward to the time we have this morning and the opportunity for all of us to learn more and how we can forge forward on our journey to educational equity for all children. So this morning I had the pleasure of setting up and giving time to a group of important leaders in the history of civil rights change and activism in this country. And I think that we couldn't have a better start to our day to hear from people who've been doing important work, leading, sacrificing, blazing, literally blazing the trail for so many Americans over the last several decades. So for those of you like me who feel like we've been doing something because we've been, it's 25 years to Teach for America and it's 23 years since I joined the Corps. And like, that's like only like incremental baby steps to what people have been doing on these issues in this country. And so our panelists today are gonna share lots of wisdom, some challenge, and, some, and lots of perspective for all of us. So with that said, we're here to talk about and reflect on Dr. King's letter from Birmingham Jail, one of the more important pieces of modern literature for us to consider about the challenges faced, the reflections on our humanity, and the challenges, quite frankly, of dealing with those that sometimes we might regard as enemies that in fact simply are people who we haven't yet figured out how to make our allies in our cause to make the world better for everyone. So with that said, I'm going to do as much as I can to get out of the way because I want to sit actually at the end and listen to and learn more from our esteemed panelists today. I'm going to quickly hand over the mic and the podium to Dr. Joyce Ladner, who in addition to being an important thought leader, civil rights icon, activist, family friend, um, is someone who I have always learned something new from every time I've heard her speak. I'm sure that all of you will. And with that said, I'd like to welcome Dr. Ladner to the microphone, and I hope all of you will join me in welcoming her to our summit. Thank you. Good morning. Was it hard for you to get up and out here this early? Okay. Um, Siku Biddle's mother and I were in SNCC together in Mississippi in the early 60s. Um, I grew up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Hey, who is that? <laughs> Raise your hand. Oh, a couple of Mississippians. Three. All right. Um, and uh, I joined, I was always conscious of the racial differences and how um, they impacted our lives. I remember asking my mother when I was five, four or five years old, why don't we have a brick school too? Because the white kids had a brick school. Imagine growing up where, in a place where you live in your own community, you have your own institutions, if you go to a store, you cannot try on a dress, a pair of shoes. You have to take them home and keep them. If they don't fit, that was it. Um, my generation was profoundly impacted by the murder of Emmett Till uh, in 1955. And I call our, gen our generation, though, especially those of us Southerners who joined the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the Emmett Till generation. And that is the perspective from which I will speak today. I want to thank um, Teach for America for inviting me to speak to you about Dr. Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail and to correlate it with the work you do in this Black History Month. I want to congratulate you on 20, your 25th anniversary. Uh, Dr. King's letter is a radical call to arms, originally written in the margins of newspapers while he was jailed obviously, 
It has become a timeless universal treatise on the moral and ethical justification for protesting the wrongs of the society. Social activists around the world have used some of the memorable phrases in his letter as a guide for their work. First, in responding to his critics who advocated moderation and told him to go slow, Dr. King wrote, justice too long delayed is justice denied. Secondly, to those who challenged him to obey current laws, King wrote that a just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law of the law of God, or the law of God. An unjust code law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just, and any law that degrades human personality is unjust. Just as an aside, when I attempted to register to vote three times while I was in college in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, I failed the test. I finally, on the third try, knowing that I was going to fail anyway, um, on the question of what is a good citizen, I wrote that a good citizen is one who obeys just laws and disobeys unjust laws. Of course, I failed again, <laughs> but I left the registrar there looking at in the world, he kept looking up at me and I'd smile. And I was 19 years old, but could not, I was a senior in college and I could not pass the test. Third, Dr. King addressed those critics who said, now is not the right time to protest. And what he said was that actually time itself, and I think this is critical, is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. Human progress never rolls on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men, and I insert, and women. And now is the time to lift our national policy from the quicksand of racial injustices to the solid rock of human dignity. Although Dr. King has been immortalized, for those of us who were in SNCC, he was a, he was a living, breathing human being. He was roughly 10 to 15 years older than most of us. We were in Dr. King's company, much like you young people today are in the company of leaders of your movement. I met him when he spoke at my college, Tougaloo College in Mississippi in 1962, and I took a photo with him that I have now, and he gave me his autograph. He came to the March on Washington office where I was working, helping to organize the march in 19, the summer of 63 several times. And he always came back to, the, to our desk to say, give us some encouraging words. And there I worked under Byron Rustin. I was on the podium when Dr. King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. And three weeks later, I saw him when he eulogized three of the four little girls murdered in Birmingham. I also saw him during the Meredith March, for about a week during the March, Mississippi. And finally, I joined the thousands of others who went to his funeral. Dr. Le King was a leader with extraordinary courage and fortitude, with morality and ethics, and a tremendous clarity of vision. Much of what he wrote in his letter is relevant to you today Things such as seizing the moment, things such as fighting un against unjust laws, and on the importance of individual action as well as group action, and critically important, the creation of the society you want because fate and chance are not going to deliver it to you. All of these are exceedingly important. We in the civil rights movement understand that people of ill will used time and lethargy and immobility against us, and they use it against you. We challenge those who stood on the sidelines to join us because if they didn't support what we were doing, racial discrimination and racial violence were going to continue. Such are the challenges you also face today in your work. Many of you are or were idealistic young teachers who wanted to increase educational opportunities and outcomes for the children who need them most. At the same time, the negative forces about which Dr. King wrote are still present. 
The Civil Rights Movement did not eliminate the misuse and abuse of power or the use of illegal and extra-legal methods to thwart the progress being made in public education or of simply waiting you out. In Dr. King's language, your opponents can use time against you so that you must always rise to the occasion and use time on your side. Empowering teachers and parents and communities to help kids get a good education is possible in some areas, but not in others, not as much in others. It is up to you to mobilize and to organize to ensure that educational opportunities for these children are increased. Three weeks after the March on Washington, where Dr. King sent us off with an idealistic expectation or dream for his children, and by extension, the children of America who need, needed to be lifted out of segregation. He went to Birmingham for the funeral of three of the four little girls who were murdered in 16th Street Baptist Church. As the police stood on top of the church and other buildings nearby with shotguns drawn at the hundreds of us standing outside, Dr. King eulogized the girls by saying, and I quote, Today, as I stand over the remains of these beautiful little girls, beautiful darling girls, I paraphrase the words of Shakespeare. Good night, sweet princesses. Good night, those who symbolize a new day. And may the flight of angels take thee to thy eternal rest. God bless you. What this tells us is that the movement saw the occasional uplifting moments such as the March on Washington, that nationalized the civil rights movement and took it out of the, the isolation of the South. But it also, we saw a lot of dark days and turmoil. And the victories often came at a heavy price in the form of the murders of Medga Evers, who was one of my mentors, of Vernon Damer, another mentor from the time I was about 10, 12 years old, and the three civil rights workers James Cheney, Matthew Goodman, and Mickey Swerner. Cheney and Swerner were my friends. Can you imagine how you would feel if people who were very, very close to you were murdered, cut down? Think of the strength that we had to, within ourselves as a group, to pull ourselves back together and keep going on. It was not until the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that there was some kind of a breakthrough. But I must tell you that in Mississippi, in those years before the breakthrough, Bob Moses often says that we were playing guerrilla warfare. There were never more than 31 of us trying to make these major changes on staff. It was a small number who were paying, playing guerrilla warfare. It was out of this turmoil, the Civil Rights Movement was a springboard for the creation of movements for women, for students, for Chicanas and the elderly, for the physically or emotionally impaired, for the environment, for children advocates, homosexuals, and for educational equity, and others. The Civil Rights Movement created a social activist model for the ages that has been exported around the world. When We Shall Overcome is sung in China or in Cairo, we know that they were exported from the Civil Rights Movement. The key elements that have been adopted for other movements were the following. Number one, the ability to articulate the unmet needs. You will never be successful unless you can tell people what it is that you're trying to do. Number two, protest. Number three, to mobilize people and number four, to organize. And I say organize, organize, organize. Because using Facebook and other forms of social media to get an, o an audience or people to come to your protest ends in not, for the most part, unless you take those people and begin to organize them for concrete goals. Some of the peop young people from T um, Black Lives Matter came to those of us on the board of the SNCC Legacy Project and asked us our advice. And we told them to organize, organize, and organize. Another contribution of the movement is that there has been a proliferation of individual and group rights. 
Rights have been codified to protect individuals and groups from being discriminated against in the areas of employment and in accordance to gender, race, sexual preference, age, and physical or emotional impairments, and as I said earlier, for, for children. Individual and class actions, lawsuits can be brought in if discrimination occurs in any of these protected categories. All of those changes are a result of what the Civil Rights Movement set forth. Simultaneously, the intersection of race and class produced much of the discrimination that threatens the life chances of children and adults alike today. Inadequate education, substandard housing, homelessness. My son works with homeless people, and I tell him each day that he's doing God's work or the Lord's work. Crime, unemployment, and underemployment, police violence, and police murders are certainly not the kinds of problems Dr. King's letter envisioned. We in the movement dealt with fairly straightforward issues, principally the right to vote and the right to use public accommodations. We had not yet gotten to the critical problems of economic power that were facing the society. However, I must say that Dr. King came out against the Vietnam War, and he paid a heavy price for it. And he was about to launch a poor people's campaign in Washington when he was assassinated. By the way, that campaign did go forth. The concentration of economic power in the hands of fewer and fewer corporations and individuals has the most corrosive effects on those that you work with. Poor neighborhoods do not have a strong tax base needed to support their schools. Martin Luther King did not envision homeless families or the hundreds of thousands of children in long-term foster care, and certainly not the murder of children as well as men and women on the streets and towns alike of this nation. Nor did he envision that the world that, I'm sorry, nor did he envision that the prisons would be filled to capacity with the fathers and a smaller number of mothers of black and brown children, leaving them behind and their welfare left to chance. This is not true for the middle class whose children are more likely to grow up in neighborhoods that are safer, with stronger tax, fund, tax basis to fund their schools, and where parents can augment the curriculum with fundraisers to pay for teachers for art, physical education, and music. Even though the civil rights movement issues today, the civil rights issues today are infinitely more complex to solve, Dr. King's words can be a guide. And as I close, he wrote, that any law that uplifts humanity is just, and any law that degrades human per personality is unjust. The caring public cannot stand by and watch the systemic degradation of young people in their schools and communities. Those who are not supportive <coughs> must be persuaded to do so. Like Dr. King, you must neutralize your opponents and turn the bystanders of all races and income groups into your supporters. Franz Fanon, the Algerian psychiatrist, wrote in his book, The Wretched of the Earth, that each generation must find its mission, fulfill it, or betray it. Thank you. Yeah, so I get to follow cute kids and then wedged in between civil rights icons. I need to talk to my Teach for America people about uh, what I sign up for next. Um, so next we're gonna hear from Bob Zellner. And I think we had this conversation with my folks over dinner one night. Um, you know, for, by intro, the simplest thing that can be said to give you a window is Bob has an interesting story. Uh, for those of you who find yourselves in this movement and in this work, conflicted or concerned about P 
people like me have some different interest or how do I fit or what's my role? Um, don't worry. People like Bob have shown that when you know what the right thing to do is, you simply have to go ahead and do it. And the people like you, the people in your family, friends, community, who just don't see, just don't get it, they eventually will or they won't, but you will still do what needs to be right. So Bob is also native of Alabama, so has a unique perspective on both Dr. King's letter and what it was like to really work hard to transform the conditions for African Americans and others in the South. So with that, Bob Zellner. Thank you, Dr. Siku. Thank you very much. Uh, I am Bob Zellner, and I grew up in L.A., uh, Lower Alabama. <laughs> and Dr. Joyce Ladner and I have known and worked with each other for over 55 years. Uh, <laughs> that was a, that's a great uh, unity between Alabama and Mississippi, because in Alabama, when I grew up there, we always thanked God for Mississippi, because it was worse. Growing up in Alabama, it was very unlikely that I would ever get involved in the civil rights movement. My dad was in the Ku Klux Klan from Birmingham, Alabama, one of the worst and most dangerous clans in the United States, the same clavern that killed the four little girls in 1963, which was the answer of the Klan to the March on Washington and the I Have a Dream speech. When my father, and it's another story, quit the Ku Klux Klan, his father, my grandfather, disowned him, and his brothers never spoke to him again in his life. That's how personal racism was when I grew up in L.A., in Lower Alabama. I was very lucky because my father not only quit the Ku Klux Klan, but when he did, he began to work with Dr. King and Joe Lowry in the SCLC to try to integrate the Southern Church. Having been in the Ku Klux Klan and having a conversion to Christianity, he was, after all, a Methodist minister. My mother was a school teacher of special education. So coming through that crucible that he came through, it was natural, of course, that I would go to our church school in Montgomery, Alabama. And while there in a sociology course on race relations, I met Dr. King, and I met Mrs. Rosa Parks. And I want to tell you briefly about that meeting. We told our professor that we were writing a paper about segregation and we wanted to go and talk to Dr. King and Mrs. Rosa Parks and E.D. Nixon who made the Montgomery bus boycott, the beginning of the modern civil rights movement. And he said, you can't do that, you'll be arrested. So we talked to Dr. King about it. We met him at federal court. If you wanted to find Dr. King in those days, he was in federal court or some other court in Montgomery. And he said, yes, you can come, but you better be ready to be arrested. And we said, that's what our professor said. And he said, that's why he's a professor. <laughs> he knows about that. You don't know much about race. And I said, that's what we're trying to learn about. Anyway, I went to the meeting. John Lewis was there, other people from SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. At the end of the meeting, Dr. King came over to the five of us students from the sociology class and said, the church is surrounded by the police and the news, and they've sent word that you're going to be arrested. And he smiled. <laughs> the very idea that anyone would smile at the prospect of being arrested was strange to us sociology students. But he's, I said, Dr. King, we need to escape. And he said, well, remember that workshop? We said you might be arrested. And we said, well, what we need to do is try to escape. So he said, I'll go out the front. If they come out there, uh, Reverend Abernathy and Mrs. Parks can take you to the basement and you can run for it. So while we were in the basement waiting for Dr. King to go out the front door, Mrs. Parks, Mrs. Rosa Parks, that quiet saint made of granite, touched me on the elbow and she said, and I haven't washed that elbow since then. <laughs> and she said, Bob, 
When you see something wrong, you have to do something about it. You can't study it forever. So if I have any message for teachers, we can not only teach about making change, we have to make that change, and that's what you're about here today, I believe. So when I grew up in Alabama, I was very uh, close to Dr. King. We were in jail together. Uh, also, when my mother quit the Ku uh, when my father quit the Ku Klux Klan, my mother was so relieved she took his Klan robes and cut up shirts for the five of us boys to go to Sunday school in. So, growing up in Alabama that way, I was very interested and excited about the letter from the Birmingham jail because when Dr. King penned that letter, he was talking to my white people in Alabama, and I've been doing that for about over 55 years now. And the challenge was that the church has to live up to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was a, t he was a preacher of the social gospel. So we're still in that struggle. I'm working today in North Carolina. And do people know that we've had over 80 to 100,000 people demonstrating at one time in Raleigh, North Carolina? How many people have heard that recently over a thousand people have been arrested in Raleigh, North Carolina, in what Dr. Barber calls, Dr. William Barber calls the third reconstruction? So that's what we're involved in today. You are an example, by the way, of a youth, another rise up of youth in this country. The very idea that we have to fight once again for what we won in the first reconstruction, which was overturned by violence. The second reconstruction, the civil rights movement that we all participated in was the second reconstruction and it was overturned by violence. Dr. King was murdered, Medgar Evers was murdered, Malcolm X was murdered, the two Kennedy brothers, Bobby and Jack were murdered. So that reconstruction was also overturned by violence. We're now in a period of the third reconstruction, and it's up to young people, it's up to teach for America to bring that message back that what Mrs. Rosa Parks said to me that long ago, when you see something wrong, you have to do something about it. And you have done that. When I joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee on September the 11th, 1961, exactly 40 years before those buildings were knocked down in New York, I understood what that dynamic was about. Because when I joined SNCC that many years ago, in the first 36 months of my work with SNCC, we lost six of our comrades to murder. They were lynched, they were killed because they wanted to do what? register black people to vote in Alabama and Mississippi. And once again, that vote is under challenge. After the civil rights movement, we thought that women's rights would never be challenged again. We thought that the all white ballot box would never be brought back. And they're bringing it back today in spades. And people think we're hurtling in a right wing direction. And I think because of Teach for America and the work that's going on and the new uprising of youth, led by Black Lives Matter and others, we're on the brink of a new progressive era. You wouldn't know it from the current political campaign, but it's all about race. And if you don't understand that race has always been at the center of our struggle in the United States and all the other uh, struggles around that, you, you simply can't do the job. The very idea that young people are totally different now is exemplified in the success of the LGBTQ struggle. And that has proceeded at warp speed. But we still have pockets of poison in the Deep South and now in the Midwest where people want to go backwards. And we won't go backwards. That's what this meeting today is about, looking at the letter from the Birmingham jail. We have to once and for all, get serious about making a huge change in this country. Now, the way that we can do that is that we can make our contribution. I tell young people now, and I've been speaking to sold out groups all over the United States. Just most recently, two days ago in Maryville, Missouri, just near Ferguson, up above Ferguson, just below Iowa, where that battle took place. 
Now, youth are on the rise, but they don't know exactly what to do with this new medium, this new social media, because there's more tools of communication and fewer and less communication going on now for some reason. How many people have heard of the Forward Together Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina before today? Have you ever, have you heard of that? Now this is a crowd, this is a whole, maybe, I don't know, 1,500 people or so, and there's maybe a dozen people in here who've heard about that. How can we have a press in this country where you can have the largest civil rights demonstration in the history of the Southern Civil Rights Movement occurring in Raleigh, North Carolina, over a thousand people arrested, 60% of them white Southerners, and you don't know about it. When that 80 to 100,000 people marched in Raleigh, North Carolina, one newspaper in the United States, USA Today of all, of all newspapers, not the Washington Post, not the New York Times, they did not cover it. It's been very difficult to get coverage for uh, the Moral Mondays movement in North Carolina, but it's going to break out anyway. When we were working in SNCC, we had to call York Gazette and Daily in Pennsylvania to get the word out about what was happening in, North, in Mississippi. My first demonstration was in uh, Macomb, Mississippi. And I want to tell you about that because we couldn't get coverage on what was happening in Mississippi even though Herbert Lee, a black farmer, had gone down to register to vote in Pike County or Amit, Amit County, Amit, Amit County, a Klan infested place in southern Mississippi. He was murdered by his next door neighbor when he went to the gin in Liberty, Mississippi. Cut, shot in the head one time and killed because he, a black man, had gone down to register to vote. E.H. Hearst, the murderer, was a member of the Mississippi State Legislature. They held an inquest over the body. They forced the black witnesses to testify that Herbert Lee, the black farmer, had attacked the uh, member of the Mississippi Legislature with a tire tool. It was a total lie. Lewis Allen witnessed the murder, he told the Justice Department, John Doerr, and because he told the Justice Department the truth, Lewis Allen was then murdered. This is in the freest country in the world. This is at a time when we were in a war, a battle with godless communism, the slave states of communism, and in the bastion of democracy just that few years ago, it was a capital crime for a black person to register to vote in southern Mississippi, and they want to go back that way. Look at the political campaign right now. Don't you know candidates who would love to make the N-word uh, common parlance again? Wouldn't they like to shock you with that because they've shocked you with just about everything they can shock you with. And the more they shock you, the more support they get. So it looks like we're dividing as a country, but I think we're gonna choose the progressive direction. I think we're gonna go forward, not backwards. We cannot go backwards in a global economy and have religious tests in this country of who's gonna have protection and who is not gonna have protection. So if I ever learned one thing from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in the letter to Miss, uh, to, uh, from the Birmingham jail, he challenged us in the white community, in the white church, to live up to what we said we believed in. So are we going to do it in this country? Both Martin Luther King and Mrs. Rosa Parks, one thing I, taught, I would learn from them and learn this saying, if you will, brotherhood and sisterhood is not so wild a dream as those who profit by postponing it pretend. So you see, they're still profiting by using that original moral compromise that the mothers and fathers of our country made and we have never settled that question. So all of these right-wingers, I don't call them Republicans, I call them right-wingers and extremists around this country, they always go back to that mother load of hate in this country, race, and they tie nationality, religion, uh, sexual preference, and all of those things to that central thing of race. We've never dealt with it yet. We talk about having a conversation. We don't need a conversation. We need action, and we need it now.
Thank you. As many of us are teachers, I'm going to give you the heads up that we're momentarily we're going to hear from Dr. Terrence Roberts, but then we're going to start taking questions. So start getting ready with your questions, and they'll be collecting cards, taking questions for the panelists. Um, Bob talked a lot about challenge, and many of us got into this to go directly into classrooms and work for and with students to help them fight through the challenges that our community societies deliver to them in schools. We're going to hear from Dr. Terrence Roberts, who, as a member of the Little Rock Nine, was a student walking into a school into the teeth of those challenges, like on the actual front lines blazing the trail for educational equity and access. So with that said, and with a nod to my mom and dad, who are now here with me in the front row, so like, if you guys got anything else to make this more challenging, <laughs> yeah, um, anything else we can make this more challenging for me, like, trot it out, um, you know, but just point of personal privilege, so, and you may have heard earlier, uh, Joyce and my mother and Bob have known each other for many, many years through SNCC, which is my personal connection to our work and the civil rights issues of our day. So with that said, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Terrence Roberts. Before I start on my prepared remarks, I'd like to have you make a mental adjustment. We, the panelists, represent three states of origin, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas. And that may confuse some of you in thinking that you have to situate civil rights and all of those activities in that region of the country. But I want you to recalibrate your mental maps so that from now on, your maps will read that the South is any place south of Canada. Absolutely. <laughs> so you're not confused. I don't want you to be confused. Because in your confusion, you might make conclusions that are unjustified and unjustifiable. A few years ago, I was invited by the Kentucky State Board of Education to come to that state and review some textbooks which had not yet been approved for use in the schools. I agreed. I went to Kentucky. I opened a social studies textbook to the chapter on Martin Luther King, Jr. And the chapter started off, sentence one, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. was a great leader for black people. At which point, I closed the book. <laughs> I didn't have to read anymore because I figured if the authors were that confused, what could I gain from reading any other words that they might have pinned on the pages to come? My feeling at that time was that something is very much amiss here. I thought as I reread Letter from Birmingham Jail that Dr. King must have felt that same way in response to the op-ed piece written by his fellow clergymen there in Alabama. They accused him of being a disruptor of the public peace. He was an outside agitator, an impatient petitioner for rights. They agreed they were yet to be bestowed, but why continue to push when, in fact, it was coming sooner or later. Dr. King's response in that very eloquent and mind-piercing letter from Birmingham jail speaks a truth that even today many find an unwillingness to receive without qualification. Black people in America have been urged to work harder to earn the rights they seek, to spend more time in the halls of learning to qualify for freedom, to gain the experience necessary to be promoted, to work, to fit in better so that neighbors will be more accepting, to be less threatening to white people so that we can be invited to sit at table. In the face of Black Lives Matter, we hear strident voices countering with all lives matter. What better way to ignore a salient plea? 
What better way to add fog to an already murky environment? What better way to stand in support of maintaining the status quo? The same truth we heard from Dr. King in 1963 has been echoed more recently in Ta-Nehisi Coates's Between the World and Me. In this letter to his son, Coates reminds all readers that while not all white people would see you thrown into the streets, most of them would certainly work hard to maintain and preserve the present status quo. And so, in response to the question, what are the challenges and hopes for the future that arise when rereading Dr. King's letter? I can say with clarity, until all of us who happen to be arrayed along this so-called racial continuum awaken to the fact that there are challenges, hopes will be delayed, postponed, or perhaps never realized. At the end of a course I taught when I was in university, I taught a course on white privilege. At the end of that course, a young white student came up to me and she said, you know, prior to taking your course, I knew nothing about white privilege. But now that I know about it, I am not giving it up. <laughs> now, oh when you think about that, when you think about that, you must face the question, what inducement must there be for white people to voluntarily give up that privilege? I don't know the answer to that question. But absent this change, all other attempts to make progress will be exercises in futility. Now, when we think about the way in which conditions for equity have evolved in this country over the past 50 years, we have to reach further back in time and space to discover the foundational elements upon which our present is built. You know, it's not unreasonable at this juncture to realize and review the national narrative. What is the national narrative? That's the origin story that we tell ourselves. You know, all countries have one. All countries have an origin story. Now, our story has been cemented into something that I have begun to call the national narrative. It's the approved text that is cemented into the mental lockbox of every student who's ever gone to school in this country. Our story, if I may be so regal, is often subsumed under the rubric of manifest destiny. Oh yes, that will, <laughs> that will resound in the minds and hearts of most of you because if you were like I am, by the time you got to fourth grade or even before, you heard the story of manifest destiny. Now, that story is a rather dubious tale of God-sanctioned genocide, yes, enslavement, rape, plunder, thievery, and armed conquest. Now, of course, in our schools, that story is sanitized so as not to excite and dismay the learners. And this is the greatest challenge to us, to somehow move beyond that sanitized version to confront the truth, to confront the truth about who we have been so that we can find a way today to do more realistic assessment about what is now necessary to change the fact of our existence. But when you get lost in all that patriotic babble, it's very difficult to convince others to even join the conversation. Now, this pull up yourself by your bootstraps narrative does little to help black people in this country make sense out of the ongoing poverty, the limited opportunity for employment and education, inadequate housing, lack of civic involvement, and limited decision making in terms of authority. I invite you to consider one of the more salient conditions for equity in these United States of America. Since its inception, America has been an affirmative action country. Now that may come as a surprise to some of you who see this whole concept of affirmative action as being something new. But in the beginning, as the founding fathers, if you will, sat around the table wondering what to do with this country, somebody suggested that perhaps we should institute some affirmative action. There was some concern about whether or not we had the resources to affirm everybody. And so the discussion languished for a bit until somebody, waking up from a long slumber at the end of the table, 
suggested we affirm white men. There was agreement at the outset, and so it was. Affirmative action for white males became the order of the day. And what that meant was that all competitors, with the exception of white males, were barred from the arena of competition. I like that concept. Somebody asked me once, Terry Roberts, do you support affirmative action? I yelled out, yes! But what I want is for it to be enlarged so that more people benefit. If then, we have a history of favoring white males to that degree, what can be said about conditions of equity today? My daughter, my youngest daughter and I, were on one of those obligatory father-daughter trips seeking colleges and universities to which she might apply. We happened to drop in at Yale University. The president at that time, Bart Giamatti, he's since died, said to all of us prospective parents and students, you parents especially might think that we here at Yale will accept your children on the basis of their SAT score. He said, not true. You may very well line them up according to SAT score, highest to lowest, but we will start at the head of that line and ask one essential question to each student in line, and that question is, do you possess outstanding athletic ability? After that group of students had been culled from the line, placed on air-conditioned buses to go directly to the dorm to begin training, we will then start at the head of the line again, and we will ask another question. Did your parents and your grandparents graduate from this university? The third question, did your parents and or grandparents contribute large sums of money to this university? And he said, as I look out at the audience, I see some of you parents with expectant faces, but hold on, not yet. This year, the senior oboe player is graduating. Do any of your students, your children, possess outstanding ability in playing the oboe? Now, if there are slots left, we might consider your child. And my daughter and I looked around, and there were slack jaws and gaping eyes. We were very sanguine because we knew in advance what the story was. We were not surprised. It's unfortunate that that reality exists, but there it is. My generation got its start under the aegis of the Plessy decision, which had been rendered in 1896. I am one of those separate but equal babies. And that actually led to a lot of confusion on my part. When I exited the womb on December 3rd in 1941, I expected to find a population of people who loved me. I was mistaken. What I found, in fact, was a system of law and custom that deemed me unacceptable. That was the kind of thing that convinced me to join later this group of nine. You know, as I think about that, I was speaking to a middle school group recently, and I was introduced as Terry Roberts, one of the Little Rock Nine. This one little kid raised his hand right away. He says, okay, so that's something you did then. What have you done lately? <laughs> I accepted that question as an honest inquiry and it forced me to come up with a response. And I said to him, young man, I consider myself to have been conscripted into the Civil Rights Army on December 3rd, 1941. And I've been an active soldier since. There was a bit of <laughs> misunderstanding between the two of us, but later I sought him out and we cleaned it up a little bit. All having to do with the fact that I do not ever want to leave anybody with the feeling that they have, quote, said the wrong thing. Martin Luther King Jr. in his letter does in fact call upon all of us to hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Now those are great words, and it presumes a future that we can look forward to with some great expectation. And in thinking about that kind of future, I see schools as a place where such an idea can take root. You and Teach for America can be instrumental in helping to make that reality come 
faster than it seems to have been. However, there are problems. Not too many months ago, I was selected to sit on a panel in Los Angeles. We were looking at the Los Angeles Unified School District. And the question was, what can we do to repair this system? My fellow panelists were becoming increasingly dissatisfied with some of my responses and comments. Finally, as a unit, they confronted me and they said, OK, Smarty, what would you do? And I said, well, actually, I think repair should be taken off the table. The system is at a point now where I think the only way out of this is to destroy it. We need to blow it up. We need to send all of school-aged children out of the country, stamp their visas, cannot return for two years. And in that two-year absence, those of us who really gave a rip about educating children would build a system from scratch. And at its base would be critical thinking. We would teach kids how to learn. We would teach them how to analyze each and every mythological concept in their world, including such things as race and meritocracy and equality of opportunity. Now, several things have to happen before schools can be trusted to do the kinds of things that I think are necessary. And that is, you have to learn to love yourself because until you're able to do that, you cannot love the children. And that will also be fundamental and foundational. And it can't be fake. Kids know the truth of the matter. If you love them, they will know it. In my early years of school, each time I stepped onto the campus of Gibbs Elementary there in Little Rock, each time I stepped onto a campus at Dunbar Middle School, Horace Mann High, I could feel the love emanating from the people who were there. You can't buy that kind of thing. I often say that kids all over this country, regardless of their so-called racial classification, should have what we had in the segregated schools in Little Rock because I was able to stockpile love in that surround and take it with me when I went to the battleground at Central High. It's one of the things that saved me. In closing, I would like to suggest to all of you assembled here today that you do several things, not the least of which is to consider very carefully when was the last time you did something for the first time. Thank you. All right. Well, that's a good start. And because we know there's so much more that our guests have to offer and so much more you all want to know, um, we will seek to find the solutions and enlightenment to meet everybody's needs in the next 10 minutes with their questions. <laughs> we, um, yeah, so question for the group. We'll do a few questions uh, before we move to wrap up. What's the most misunderstood part of King's letter and the civil rights movement in general? Yeah, you have to pick one misunderstood thing. You want us to answer that? Yeah. Right ah. <laughs> the most misunderstood part of it. Wow, that is a good question. And there's so many candidates uh, for, for the answer. But I think if I had to pick any one thing, it would be that his message was for a limited audience. Uh, I think we have to expand our thinking to understand that Dr. King was concerned about the soul of this country, so much so that he gave his life for it. And he's speaking to all of us all the time. Well, as I try to write my talk to you today, <clears throat> by the way, it was not easy you know, to extract some basic principles from his very lengthy letter and then give them to you um, and you use them as you wish. I think, you know, that people thought he was talking to um, black people. Bob talked about the white people that, that, uh, who were the target audience, power brokers, ministers and others. But he was also speaking to people don't, probably don't know that he was speaking also to his black critics, that there were those black ministers, for example, uh, other conservative, conservative black leaders, uh, like Condoleezza Rice's father, who was a minister, uh, who told him that you must go slow. 
but his messages did have a universal appeal. I said earlier that it was the timeless quality and the universal themes that could be extracted from this letter that could be used internationally and not just to those specific people. A lot of people don't think about it in those terms. Okay, thank you. I think the most uh, misunderstood part of the letter from Birmingham jail is uh, Dr. King was, he was much more radical and he was much more revolutionary than uh, even in, when that letter was written, was it 1963? Right. He had another five years to live. And by the time he reached the end of his life, he made it very clear to the whole nation and the world that maybe there was a liberal consensus national, nationwide to do away with the worst aspects of segregation and de jure racism. The worst aspects, that was a liberal consensus around the country uh, because we had a lot of support actually from the government and others for the voter registration work and things that we were doing. But the people had no idea uh, what his uh, belief about uh, economics was, or Ella Baker's uh, economics. And by the time he got ready uh, in 1967 to launch the Poor People's Campaign, it became very clear that he was going well past the liberal consensus to do away with the worst aspects of race and segregation to a thoroughgoing revolution, an economic and political revolution in this country. And that's what we are trying to do now because we've had a downturn in the last 25 or 30 years where we have hollowed out the middle class and we have decimated all of the people who have gained from 1960 and we have a lot to make up for. Wow. Well, what work do you all feel like still needs to be done to desegregate our public schools and how can teachers and future leaders expedite, motivate, and organize to that end? Well, <clears throat> it would help if there were a general commitment to this whole concept of desegregation. Uh, I haven't seen that. Mm -hmm. People often uh, say to me today that schools seem to be more segregated today than they were in your day. I said, no, no, that's not true. Uh, it's been the same. Nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. Uh, and it's a very confusing element. But I don't think there's any real support for this notion of desegregation. When you think about it, most Americans choose to live monoracial, monocultural lives. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's one of the most difficult <coughs> challenges. And I think that what has to be done is that the base of support has to be expanded. I challenge you to seek out stakeholders, um, convince those who are not convinced, go to the young tech.com people in Silicon Valley and make the case that they don't have to continue importing talent from India, mm -hmm. but they can begin to make these schools <clears throat> into the kinds of laboratories that they want them to. Um, I recall that when Mississippi schools desegregated, uh, the principal, in one case in Alabama, a principal, of a school became a janitor in the larger school. The principal in my school became one of the assistant principals. Most of the, uh, simultaneously with desegregation also came uh, the rise of the white um, private schools. And that therein lies the case, only those who cannot afford to go to those schools are in the desegregated schools. I think that as we see the resegregation of America and of Donald Trump who has made enemies of, of the brown children in our society, and I think he'll begin to call us niggers pretty soon, um, and say that we too are rapists and murderers, um, that we have to vote these people out. You have to develop a consensus of people in elective office. You have to make more demands on those people You've got to, the clarity of vision that Dr. King had was that he was able to tell people exactly what it was that 
that, what would happen to them if they didn't get involved. And that's what you have to do. As long as we have balkanized communities, they lose too. As Bob Moses, I mean, as, as, not Bob Moses, but as Bob Zellner was saying, that he's always worked with the white community. They lose as well. I don't have any better, uh, better answers to give you that, than that. But um, it's a tough one. Uh, I'll, I'll try a, a little bit on that one. Uh, the legacy of Dr. King and SNCC and NAACP and CORE and SCLC was the 64 Public Accommodations Act, the 65 Voting Rights Act, and the Housing uh, Act of 68. That was passed after he was assassinated. It probably never would have been a pass, a pass if he hadn't just been assassinated. But we still live in the most segregated uh, countries in the world, probably. I've taught university in Long Island, in the Hamptons, and that is one of the most segregated sections of the whole United States. So housing was uh, discrimination was outlawed all those years ago, 1968, and we still have it, and it's increasing. Uh, gentrification in Washington, D.C. and a lot of other places are displacing black people, poor people, Latinos, immigrants, and so forth. We still have the same game going on because we still have the same establishment and we have to challenge them. You need to ask if integration is the goal. Or do you produce the most competitive and competent students in the country? That's the question. Does it come, I mean, integration is not going to make your kids smarter. It will expose children on both sides of the racial divide, or all sides, to each other. And that will be a help. And that will help. But I don't think that integration is the objective, but rather increasing the support for your schools from as many people as possible and producing highly competitive children students. Great. Um, this, and this came up earlier um, in some of the comments that Bob was making. You know, how do we as educators um, embolden our LGBTQ black and brown students to participate in a movement that quite frankly has historically deprioritized that portion of their identity? Could you break that last phrase down? Yeah. yeah. Well, re rephrase the question. Sure thing. Yeah. Just so since we're keeping it super real here, you know, in our movement for educational equity and in, you know, frankly, in the civil rights movement around equality and justice in this country, we have often engaged many of our uh, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual friends, colleagues, supporters. But when push has come to shove, we almost always invariably ask them to deprioritize that part of themselves for some larger goal we're working on. How do we help support our students so they no longer have to do that in right. their life? Who is this we you're speaking of? <laughs> uh, so I get to ask the questions here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, can, I can give you one example Go of a we. It. Thank you, Bob. Uh, <laughs> When I say we, I mean a huge movement going on in North Carolina and around the country, called, generally called the Forward Together Moral Movement. But in North Carolina, what we do, we have 150 organizations that uh, go across all of the interests of all progressives and, uh, and generally human beings. And what we do is that each one doesn't work in their silo. We don't have a silo of LGBTQ interests and one in voter rights and one in the uh, environment and so forth. All the environmental people work on all the issues. And Reverend Barber was one that in North Carolina when they tried to put it in our uh, constitution, in fact they did, outlawing equal marriage as the NAACP state president and a black minister, evangelical minister, he led the uh, fight against putting that in the constitution. He changed the, uh, the policy of the NAACP in North Carolina then the national changed its policy and then uh, 
uh, President Obama came out soon after, and it helped speed up that whole thing. So we uh, use the, the LGBTQ struggle along with all the rest of them, and sometimes somebody working on voter rights will talk about LGBTQ rights and, and vice versa. So we support all of those issues together so it doesn't uh, sub subliminate any one cause to any other. They are all upheld together in a forward together progressive movement. Let's assume that the we is your school. Let's assume that the we is your classroom. The question is, do you give, integrate the, those students into the body of your classroom? Do you pull them from the margins? Do you help to make it possible for them to not be bullied? Do you, as teachers, set the example by treating them equally. I think that on the micro level is what I would be concerned about. The acceptance comes from, we use the love, we use the word love back in the 60s. That's a good word. <laughs> the love and the respect that you give them. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of affirming their dignity. Yeah, affirming their dignity is, is the critical part so that they don't feel the isolation. And I live here in D.C. and, you know, where gay rights is, is not a side show, but it's, it, you know, we have the most affirming city for gay people. But if I go home to Mississippi, I know that gay people are still called fags and all, sissies and all kinds of other names. So that wherever you are, you, it is your job to bring them in. Wow, so we've got just a few more minutes here. So I'd love to actually get a final thought from each of you. And since I know you all have so many thoughts, I'll ask you for one specific one as we begin to wind down. And we'll start with Dr. Roberts since I'm still asking questions and hopefully he's answering them. <laughs> This is for you. What were your initial thoughts when you walked into Central High School and what made you not turn around and go immediately? You know, one of the first things I can remember is I felt a great deal of fear. I'd never been that afraid in my life. Mm -hmm. I thought that my name was gonna probably wind up on some coroner's list before the day was over. But I was there in spite of that fear because the law was now on my side. You know, schools have a way of instilling stuff within you, and from the brief schooling that I'd had prior to that time, I had learned that, quote, we are a nation of law-abiding people. <laughs> Whether we were or not, I believed it. And so <laughs> the 54 decision that said I could go to that school was in force, and I was going to model law-abiding behavior. Wow, thank you. Bob, you talked about belief that in this reconstruction period is going to yield real progress. What do you see in the current crop of presidential candidates, some of which have been alluded to directly and indirectly in our conversation today, that's going to help us fight for justice and progress? Uh, very good question. Uh, well, first of all, in both sides of the political spectrum, the establishment is under tremendous pressure and under tremendous attack, and rightly so. There is no reason in the world that we should be surprised or uh, shun the word liberal, the word socialist, or communist, or any of those things. We've been crippled in this country because we have a skewed so far to the right that Americans think of Hillary uh, excuse me for using her first name, Mrs. Clinton, and they think of Mrs. Clinton and President Obama as extreme, uh, extreme leftist. And uh, Europeans laugh because they're, <laughs> they're, uh, they're in the center. So if you're in the center now, you're considered yeah. to be. So we need a new paradigm in this country, and some of those candidates are doing it. Uh, I'm a Bernieite right now, and I know I'll probably wind up a Hillaryite. I was a Hillaryite before, and I wound up an Obamaite. So we have to be 
we have to be flexible in this, but we have to challenge the establishment and be willing to have different economic paradigms and anything is on the table. Mm, very good. Wow. Anything is on the table and be flexible. Things that everybody yeah, in this What room. we need is a peaceful, nonviolent, democratic revolution. No <laughs> I think I've heard people talk about that before. <laughs> we're on to something. Um, and so while we're on the subject of peace and, 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 and frankly, instances where we don't really see peace, uh, Joyce, you know, in thinking about the current juvenile justice system and the disproportionate number of black and Latino young men in the system, what, you know, what recommendations or thoughts do you have on what do educators and education policy makers need to do to reverse this dangerous path and course that we're on? Very, very good question. Um, here in the district, a, one of the city council members just introduced a bill that would allow the district, it's a model, adopted as a model program from, from I think Connecticut, that would pay young people, high risk young people, put them in program, diversion programs. Um, as a, a way to incentivize, a way to give them incentives to not go in the wrong direction. I know that one of the charter schools that was started here in, in D.C. started by James Foreman, Jr., whose father was the, our executive secretary of SNCC, Jim Foreman. James Lumumba. James Lumumba. And whose mother is Dickie Romilly who, believe it or not, whose mother was um, Jessica Mitford, one of the famous British Mitford sisters. Uh, and a niece of Winston Churchill. Right, we, a niece of Winston Churchill. Anyway, James has great pedigree. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he, he works in, in this field. Uh, but he and, um, oh my, when you start getting old, your memory just goes. <laughs> David Domenici, yeah. son of yep. Senator Sorry. Pete Domenici, Republican of Arizona. They, they started, uh, they were, were um, mm -hmm. defense lawyers in the youth division here in D.C. And what they saw was that children who were committing petty crimes often were doing so because they didn't have money. Uh, and what they asked them is, what would you want most? They said, education and a way to make, make money to sustain myself. So they started uh, uh, stepwise with, they started with a pizza delivery business so that the kids made an income. They made their own pizzas and they sold them. They also started a, an elementary kind of basic tutoring program and that grew into the Maya Angelou Charter Schools. I think there are three locations, but that's how it began. And that's how you begin. Many of you are in communities and not just in the school. Your schools need to find ways to, uh, of diversion for those kids that in your classes that you think are high risk for going to prison. We have to stop them in the pipeline before they get there. And there are all kinds of other, other ways to do it as well. But the other thing is, <coughs> once we, we've got to lobby to, get, to change the laws so that kids are not picked up for and sent to prison for petty things. A change in the laws is absolutely necessary. Wow. So here I am again left with, we need to rethink the agenda next time, <laughs> following up on all that. In our final couple of minutes, I think all I'm really left here to do is to summarize a few things we heard today, I encourage you all to take what you got here today and use it. And so as a reminder, Joyce pointed out to us that, you know, there are things that good citizens do. 
And they're not always nice things that good citizens do, and they're not always easy things good citizens do. But you've got to ask yourself that question. Am I prepared to be a good citizen and do the hard things a good citizen needs to do? This has to be about not just each and every one of us in our individual action, but about how we collectively, how we together rise, mobilize, and organize. We have to, as Bob pointed out, do something. There's a time to talk. There's a time to plan. There's a time to reflect. But there's got to be lots more time to do something. We're here because Teach for America brought us together over the last 25 years into this network and into this family. So if there's anything that we individually and collectively can and ought to be able to do, it's to teach. It's to teach our friends, our colleagues, our family, the things we need them to know so they can and will act better and harder and faster in the interest of all of our children. We have to persevere. Some of us look back and reflect We've been at this thing for 25 years. Mom and Joyce and Bob can reflect on things they've been doing for 50 years. So we're just getting warmed up. There's a lot more that we can and need to do together. Sometimes the privilege that has some of us afraid and uncomfortable about being in the space is the exact thing we need to leverage and lean on to help us push through and do those things that need to be done. And we need to remember that Dr. King was in fact a real, radical, and revolutionary thinker and leader. This isn't about us nickel and diming and bunting for a base hit here and there. This is absolutely about real, hardcore, radical, revolutionary change. So there are going to be lots of moments when it's hard and it's uncomfortable and you don't want to do the next thing. And then you remember. <laughs> the several hundred people in this room here today and the 15,000 here with us this weekend and the tens of thousands of us who started this journey called Teach for America and the hundreds of thousands and millions of friends, allies, students who we've touched and engaged and we pull them in to help us continue to do the important work because they're right. The path to success and prosperity of this country is not in importing all the talent to do the complicated and difficult things and hard thinking work that needs to be done. The way all of this changes is when we recognize we've got everything we need and we need to invest in all, not some, not most, not all the ones we like, but all the children, all the families, all the communities, so that all of them have opportunity. So that we can't look around and honestly say, well, you know, because you're this or because you're that, you're just not gonna have an equal or a fair or a decent chance. And so, in closing, I ask you to think about 25 years from now, how many of us in this room or in this building today are gonna be able to look back and say, I've been with Carrie and Melinda and Marco for 50 years, banging away 
at the hard, hard work. We'll have some scars, we'll have some horror stories, but we'll also have some really good stories about all the things we've done, the lives we've changed, and the country that we've transformed into not the one that we thought we were supposed to have, but the one we allegedly claimed we wanted to have when it was created, one that is actually designed for all the people to go forth and do anything and everything they can do to be their very best. So with that, all I ask you to do is look, look deep within. Find the fuel that's going to take you forward. Find the friends you need to support the work. Put one foot in front of the other and go forth. Because ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are my friends and those of you who will become my friends over the next 25 years, Together we rise. Thank you all very much, and please congratulate our...